Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 25 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the multiverse. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today, of course, is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Uh, before we get started, folks, I want to re- uh, let you know about something new we have on our website uh, at uh, sqpn.com slash mysterious we have the new mysterious world bookstore so uh jimmy brings mentions a lot of uh resources in this uh show uh lots of links to books and other stuff and so anything that uh, is available for purchase so we'll put links to stuff in the show notes as usual but anything that's available for purchase you can just go to the bookstore at that link sqpn.com slash uh mysterious you can go to that and click on the link for the bookstore and all of it will be listed there by episode. Now you'll you'll notice some episodes are missing just because they didn't have books really you know uh, recommended for that episode. But anything, but it's all there in one place. So if you're looking yeah. for something, you're not sure what episode it was, you can find it all there in one uh, listing. Yeah, it'll have it'll have books, it'll have uh, DVDs or online documentaries that you can uh, pay to watch and things like that. Anything yes. for purchase will be there. Yes, exactly. And uh, just as a disclaimer. Um, a lot of those things go to Amazon, and if you buy some of the Amazon, it helps SQPN. Uh, there's an affiliation, uh, a, a little bit of money that comes back yeah. to support the show and help us continue to do what we do. So uh, we do appreciate if you if you go through those links when you uh, when you want to purchase. Yeah. So uh, so let's get right to today's topic, which is uh, as I mentioned, m- the multiverse. So folks, you've probably heard of m- the the multiverse or parallel worlds in a lot of science fiction TV shows and in uh, movies and books, and and it's this idea that there are parallel worlds and parallel timelines, um, uh, and and in some of these stories, there is an infinite number of slightly different versions of us that exist. You know uh, where uh, every decision that we make is a branching universe, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, now maybe skept- Spock has a beard or something. <laughs> right. He's <laughs> he's a beard, therefore is evil. Uh, of course, skeptics, you know, kind of poo-poo this idea, but many scientists today are actually taking it seriously. So today on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, we're going to take on this topic and discuss whether parallel worlds might exist, including parallel copies of us. So, so Jimmy, what's going on here? What is what is the what, let's start at the basics. What is the multiverse? Okay, so the term multiverse is a fairly recent coinage. It's obviously a play on universe, and it's kind of ironic because the term universe, you know, una means one, and so uh, the idea of the universe originally was it's everything, all of reality summed up into one, and so that was the idea for the universe. But then um, uh, people said, well, maybe there are different pockets in all of reality that are very similar to each other and that are kind of like parallel universes. And if you're if if uh, there was a time where you could have been a pedant and say, well, it, it, these are just other parts of the universe, because by definition, the <laughs> universe is all of reality summed up into one. Um, but language has its own life. And eventually the term multiverse, multi meaning many, uh, came to be the established term for the whole collection of different pockets, and each pocket is then known as a universe. Um, there are different types of multiverses, according to uh, this, you know, the speculation that's out there. Uh, Max Tegmark, who's a physicist, has a famous fourfold way of classifying different types of multiverses. Um, you mentioned parallel timelines, for example. Mm-hmm. That's one example of how you could have a multiverse, but there are others. Uh, and Tegmark has identified four. Some people would classify them other ways. There are other ways of classifying them and finer grained distinctions, but Tegmark's basic four are kind of a standard starting point. So his type one multiverse is basically just a physical extension of our own universe out beyond the um, 
beyond what's called the Hubble volume, which is the area of the visible universe that's accessible to us, you know, that we can observe because there we we can't see an edge to the universe and right. our minds have trouble imagining edges anyway. And so for a lot of history, people assumed that space is infinite. Um, and this is a common assumption among uh, among astronomers for uh, a long period of time, even into the early <clears throat> even into the early 20th century. Um, the idea before we knew about other galaxies was that basically space was infinite and it just had the Milky Way sitting in it. And that was all. Hmm. Um, and then we realized that these nebulas we saw in the sky, some of them are actually galaxies very far away. And that, you know, was a major kind of world shaking discovery in astronomy um, to realize that the Milky Way isn't all of everything in the universe. Uh, but the idea of our universe, just physical space extending on infinitely is something that uh, is still around. And so since we can't see an edge and since we have trouble imagining edges, a lot of astronomers would say, OK, our, our, we can see part of the universe, the part that light has had time to reach us. Um, but uh, there are other parts of the universe beyond that that obey the same physical laws that we have here. They just uh, we just can't see them because they're too far away for the light to reach us, to ever reach us since the universe is expanding. And so they're they're causally isolated from us, and therefore they're classified, according to this theory, as other universes. Um, the idea is then that in if you have the laws of our universe operating ran, operating on matter in all these different regions, Sooner or later, every combination of matter that can happen under the laws of physics is going to happen somewhere, somewhere out there. Whatever freaky, weird, rare chance it involves, a particular circumstance uh, will happen. So, for example, since unicorns are physically possible, there would be unicorns out there somewhere. Hmm. Uh, since aliens are physically possible, aliens are out there somewhere, whether it's in our universe or or a place we can't see. Um, and since slightly different versions of us are possible, slightly different versions of us are out there in the same physical space we occupy. They're just too far away for us to see, to ever see. Hmm. And uh, Tegmark has even calculated how close our nearest clones ought to be. Um, and he, uh, I may be, I may have, he's calculated that it's 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 115 meters away. And that's kind of hard for me to imagine in meters, a number like that. So I converted it to light years, uh, which is for some reason, slightly easier for me to imagine. And, uh, they would be 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 100 light years away or 10 to the power of Google light years right. away. Um, I may be off by an order of magnitude there, but I think I, I think that's the approximate number. So could, uh, could, so that's I, his type one. Yeah. Could I make it so like maybe by analogy, because I have a hard time imagining this at all. So maybe if our universe is the size of a marble, we're mm -hmm. talking like to the distance of the moon from that uh, marble? Some, something, something like that. Like uh, a the massive basic, number. Yeah, it's a, it's a really massive number, 10 to the power of Google, Google being 10 to the power of 100. Yeah. Um, that many light years away. So um, I, I, I'd, I'd have to do some <laughs> further calculation yeah. to, give, to convert it to the marble thing. But as a physical picture, um, you know, if you want to think of our – if you think of a gumball machine and you think of our, um, our uh, universe as one of the gumballs, it's surrounded by all these other gumballs. Right. Um, and a, an even better analogy would be if you think of like a um, – if someone has baked gumballs, has baked a gumball into a uh, into Jello, yeah. Um, all of that other Jello is out there 
Um, but we can only see what's in our little gumball area. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's it's hard to imagine when you when the, when you get to big as we as we have said before, big numbers are big. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So 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 that's type one. Right. Type one is just physical space extends infinitely, and sooner or later you get repetitions of events. Okay. Um, type two is different. Type two says, okay, um, the laws of physics don't have to be constant. Maybe there are universes where the laws of physics are different. So instead of having, say, the expansion rate that our universe does, which is driven by dark energy, maybe there's a different amount of dark energy out there. Or maybe the gravitational constant is different, or maybe the charge of an electron is different. And so um, the idea for the type two multiverse is it would be every universe with every different combination of physical constants that are possible. Uh, it's often pointed out that our universe seems uniquely suited to having life in it. Uh, the gravitational constant has to be just the right number, or if it's even slightly off, stars won't produce the atoms you need for life. Um, you know, protons have to have a certain charge and mass. Electrons have to have a certain charge and mass, or the right elements don't come around for life. And so um, ast astronomers have noted that there, are, and physicists have noted there are, are, are quite a number of constants, like a couple of dozen, that have to be precisely set in order for life to exist. And so some people have said, okay, that's a good design argument. You know, it looks like our universe is designed by a designer. Um, <clears throat> the uh, alternative to that that's proposed is, well, maybe, um, maybe universes are kind of like a slot machine and the laws of physics come up randomly with different constants in different universes. So if there are a bunch of universes which each have slightly different physical constants, some of them will have the right constants for life, and we just happen to live in one of those. It's kind of like if you're a fish, you may notice that the pond that you live in is suitable for you to be there, um, but that doesn't mean there aren't areas outside of the pond that are not suitable for you to live and mm -hmm. that are not inhabited by fish. So if you're in a pond in a forest, well, there's all that other forest out there where there are no fish because it's not suitable for them. Fish only exists where where it is suitable. And so people like us, humans, um, anthropoi, uh, only exist where the conditions are right for us. And so this is what's known as the anthropic principle. And there are different versions of the anthropic principle. But the basic idea is we're, we observe the, the kind of universe we do because it's the only kind of place we could exist. And presumably, according to the type two multiverse theory, there are loads of other universes out there, presumably with no life in them. Uh, because their physical constants are different and they uh, they are not suitable for life, just like the forest is not a suitable place for a fish. Okay. So that's the type two universe, uh, multiverse theory. Type three is based on uh, on what you mentioned, alternate timelines. And this gets into uh, quantum mechanics, which is a theory uh, having to do with the very small uh, aspects of reality, like individual particles within atoms and so forth. That's what quantum theory deals with. And the idea is that um, every time a particle decides to be in one place rather than another place, you have a split in the timeline. And so according to type three multiverse theory, every possible timeline based on quantum events happens. Uh, we don't see them because those other timelines have decohered from ours. That's the term that gets used. Um, but, uh, but they're all out there. It's kind of like if, uh, if, if, and you get a version of this in science fiction where instead of just particles uh, deciding to be one place or another, people make choices. Mm -hmm. And so like there's a timeline where 
you decided to get married to your wife and you're, you, Dom Bettinelli, are living in that timeline. Yep. But you could have decided not to marry your wife. You could have decided to marry someone else or not to marry at all. And so those choices also, according to type three multiverse theory, also got made. You're just not living in those timelines. They branched off from this one when you made the choice to marry your wife. So, Jimmy, just because I know my wife is listening right now to this podcast, I just uh -huh. want to let her know that I would marry you in every timeline. <laughs> well, that's reassuring to hear. <laughs> Not sure all type multiverse theorists are going to agree with that. That's okay. I, so I had to yeah. do that just because. You know, yeah. Uh, domestic tranquility. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, that's an appropriate thing to say in this timeline. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no problem. So, uh, so that's type three multiverse theory. And then type four is basically the proposal that every math, every possible mathematically describable universe exists. Um, and this is basically equivalent, as I understand it, to saying every logically possible state of affairs exists somewhere out okay. there. Um, and so uh, the, for example, I mean, we mentioned unicorns and aliens, any bizarre thing you can imagine happening as long as it doesn't evolve a logical contradiction, it's out there. Uh, things like square circles and four-sided triangles are not out there because they involve logical contradictions. Right. Um, so would a Dom Bettinelli as a married bachelor, that's a logical contradiction. You can't be right. both married and a bachelor. So there's no timeline where Dom Bettinelli is a married bachelor. Um, but every other possible, every other possibility, as long as there's not a logical contradiction, is real. Okay. So that's type four. So just quick review, type one, our universe extends infinitely and you under the same laws and you get repetitions eventually. Um, type two, every possible combination of laws is applies to some universe. Type three, every possible timeline happens. And type four, every mathematically or logically possible state of affairs happens. Okay. Now, within some of these, you get different uh, proposals for um, how universes branch off from each other. In the timeline theory, it's kind of obvious, you know, a choice gets made uh, and that's what causes the branch. It, with some of these others, um, like with type two, how do uh, the question would be, how do these other universes get there? And there are proposals like maybe our universe buds off or some primordial universe buds off new universes. And those un and when that happens, it's like a slot machine lever gets pulled and a new random combination of physical constants comes up or. Uh, maybe you have even collisions between different universes, like two planets can smack into each other. Like apparently the Earth moon system, which is really two planets, no matter what they say it is. <laughs> I mean, the moon is a planet. I'm I'm just sorry, but it is we're living. We are living on Terra major and the moon is Terra minor. <laughs> um, but uh, apparently the early Earth was struck by an object. It's called Theia the name for this hypothetical object. Uh, it was about the size of Mars and it smashed into Earth and that created a huge cloud of debris and eventually that settled out into the Earth-Moon system. And so there are ideas that maybe our universe exists on what's called a brain, short for membrane, a multidimensional structure. And maybe these brains are floating around and they collide with each other. And when that happens, you get a new Big Bang with new physical constants in the newly born universe. So there are different theories about how these universes come about within the basic four types. Okay. And so does there, it, I don't want to get too much into the, the weeds of quantum physics, but yeah, for the branching timelines based on quantum events, mm -hmm. um, is it, is it because quantum physics says that both, quantum states both quantum uh, results I, i'm not sure the right terminology have mm -hmm. to exist or 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 
Well, it's there are different. So there are different ways that um, that quantum mechanics gets understood. One of the things about quantum mechanics is it doesn't obey our normal intuitions about how events happen. We think of, uh, par- for example, particles as being different than waves, and we think of particles as occupying just one space. Um, at any given moment, but it, the way some quantum experiments work, it looks like particles, and when something moves from one place to another, it takes only one path. But in the quantum world, it it looks like um, particles exist in multiple places at one time until you measure them, right. and and then it 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 like solidifies its position. Uh, Similarly, it looks like particles take every possible path between their start point and their destination point. Simultaneously, they're taking all of these different paths. Mm. And if you measure that, the path they're taking, it then messes with that. Um, so, uh, So there are different ways of interpreting this. One of the common ways these days is what's called the many worlds interpretation. And the many worlds interpretation says, well, we can't distinguish uh, uniquely between these things. So all of these possibilities are valid. They're all real. And when you measure it, you just lock yourself down into one of these possible worlds. But that doesn't mean the others aren't real. Okay. I think I get that. So when we, so when we get, comes down to it, the, the, this is the, the claim is, that that one of these theories is one or all or all okay uh is uh, one or are, more are the are the the state of the universe or multiverse that's, yes that's the claim yeah the basic claim is that at least one and maybe all of these different possible types of multiverses are real okay and then of course then the counter claim is that, that they don't exist, that there is only one universe, and all of this multiverse talk is unscientific philosophical speculation. Okay. All right. Um, and and I'm, I'm gonna guess you're going to get into why why they yeah. would be able to dismiss it. Okay. So yeah. Uh, so what do we know about this uh, here? Well, we know that scientists are divided. You have some scientists who are big fans of the multiverse theory and are certain that it's true. You have other scientists who say it is not at all certain, and we frankly don't have evidence for this. Um, one of the things <clears throat> that is uh, uh, happening right now in physics is scientists are trying to think of ways that we could potentially detect these uh, these different universes, and there are if they're there. And there are some interesting proposals in that regard. One of the things that has been suggested is that dark matter may be um, evidence of a nearby universe. Uh, Dark matter is matter that has a gravitational effect on our universe, even though it doesn't seem to otherwise interact with matter in our universe. So we can't see it. uh, We can't poke it. We can't test it. We can't do anything with it at this point, but it does have this gravitational effect. And it's apparently very important um, for the formation of galaxies, which are then important for the formation of stars. And um, one of the, we can even map where it looks like the dark matter is. And basically, wherever you find matter in our universe, there seems to be dark matter associated with it. So there's dark matter in the room with you right now. Um, You just can't (laughs) detect it because it doesn't interact with the normal matter in your universe, except gravitationally. And, um, And so the proposal is, well, maybe there's a universe next door that has a lot of matter in it, and the matter from that universe, the gravity that that matter generates is spilling over into our universe and causing the galaxies, causing matter in our universe to clump around it to form galaxies and stars and things like that. Hmm. So it's a proposal. And then that would explain why we can't interact with it because it's in another universe and it's just the gravity that bleeds over. Right. Um, So that's a speculation. And that could be what dark matter is. But the rejoinder is we don't have proof that that's what dark matter is. Dark matter could be something else that lives in our universe. Right. 
So that's part of the the problem is, is is trying to come up with proofs or evidence about these various claims then. Right. It's it's easy to make proposals like with quantum mechanics, you know, the many worlds interpretation is one interpretation, but how do you prove that's the right interpretation? Because there are other interpretations. And right now, the correct interpretation of quantum mechanics is up in the air. Uh, if you read textbooks, the um, the standard interpretation you'll be taught is what's known as the Copenhagen interpretation. But scientists will say, actually, that's just the kind of the textbook thing that you teach students out in the real lab world. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty about what the what the right interpretation is. Uh, we also don't have statistical evidence of collisions between universes, because if if universes has, had collided with each other, there could be ramifications. Like when, you know, if you have two things smack into each other, they vibrate. And uh, there was, in fact, a um, like a, 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 an asteroid that hit the moon hundreds of years ago. Some monks in Europe saw it mm. when, it, you know, this big they're watching the sky and this big thing explodes off the moon when an asteroid hit it they didn't know what it was but when we sent the apollo missions there they set up seismographs and the moon is still vibrating oh, wow. from that impact all those centuries ago huh. and so if one universe hit another universe and budded ours you might expect to see evidence of that in uh, like the cosmic microwave background radiation, for example. And um, Roger Penrose, a British physicist, claimed that he saw patterns uh, in the astronomical data that suggested a prior universe. Hmm. But subsequent analyses of that same data has said, nah, it doesn't look like we have a good pattern here. And so, um, so at this point, we don't have good evidence for this, and it's hard to come up with a test that could falsify the idea that there are other universes out there. Because, uh, and falsification is a key concept in science. It's even sometimes claimed that unless you can propose an experiment that would allow you to falsify an idea, then it's then you then the claim you're making is not scientific. Hmm. Um, it's like uh, the claim God exists. There's no way God is a non physical being. Well, our physical apparatuses here can our telescopes, our microscopes, everything they can only measure physical things. So there's no way they could interact with a fundamentally non physical thing, and that means there's no way you could show that the idea of God is false based on scientific tests. You might have philosophical arguments mm -hmm. or theological arguments, but that's not scientific. That's a different realm of knowledge. Doesn't mean it's invalid. It just means it's not science. Right. And so, um, so since we can't run a test that would falsify the existence of other universes, um, the claim is this is, this is just not uh, scientific. It's, it's philosophical speculation. So, uh, okay, <laughs> my brain is expanding, <laughs> and hopefully the, cool. for the listener too. So, um, part of, and so unfalsifiable. Okay, just just kind of all that stuff is sort of settling in my brain. So, where do we go from from here then, in the reason perspective? Well, I want to make an argument that I haven't seen anybody else make regarding this. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, folks might want to listen to this section of the podcast more than once. I'm going to try to say it as simply as I can. But let's take the everything. It, let's let's start with the type one multiverse and just think of, OK, we've got infinite space and the same physical laws. And and under those laws, every possible event that can happen, given enough time and we've got infinite time here, um, will happen just randomly. And we just happen to live in an area of space where the can where you know stars and planets that are suitable for life formed, and so we arose, and so we see them. Okay. If you're positing infinite time and space with random events happening, it seems like this could undo all of science. 
it seems like this would fundament this conjecture could fundamentally undermine all of science because you're proposing that there's some set of laws that are operating like gravity mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, so things fall down and you see things falling down. Well, the only reason we propose the, the law of gravity is because we see things fall down. Um, but if you say, well, maybe it's all random, we've got all possibilities happening, <clears throat> maybe um, we just happen to live in, a, in an area of space where for a long time, things have randomly fallen down. Maybe they actually randomly fall in any direction or move in any direction. If you've really got infinite space and time out there, and you let and you say it's there's a fundamental element of randomness in everything maybe that randomness is everything maybe the universe is just a chaos and 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 it's all purely random and there are no laws there are no scientific laws to be discovered and we just happen to live in an area where the coin flips have been coming up heads for a particular run of time but there's no reason to think that if it's truly random, that it's not going to come up tails in the future. Hmm. So it seems to me that proposing <clears throat> um, infinite randomness is, in, is scientifically indistinguishable from saying that there are no scientific laws and based on the anthropic principle, we just happen to be living in an area where it looks like random events have been behaving in, an, in a lawful way during our observational history. And so um, you can make the assumption that that's not the case, that there are laws behind the phenomena we see, but that's an assumption and when you start saying, OK, infinite randomness out there, that has the potential to undermine all of science. And you have to make a non-scientific because you can't falsify it. You have to make a non-scientific assumption that we're not living in a multiverse full of just chaos with no actual laws. Right. So if the universe is infinite and if it's infinitely random, so any imaginable non-contradictory thing. Is it possible, or are you including well, contradictory things in that? It'll, not not contradictory because that would that that violates laws of logic. Although yep. you could then question the laws of logic, I suppose. But right. I'm not doing that at the moment. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, but uh, the question I would put to um to people who are proposing an infinite number of multiverses is uh, and based on incorporating this randomness element is how do you how do you then in a scientific way justify your belief in natural law because the whole the part of the point of proposing like with the type 2 multiverses where they all have different laws right. um how, that was as a that was proposed as a way of explaining why our universe has the constants it does to allow for life. It's just random. We just happen to be in a space where randomly these laws came up. Well, how do you know that there even are laws? How do you know it's not just that our universe has random events happening in it and we happen to get a series of random things that look like laws, but they're really not? Right. And if you if you are prepared to make a, an unfalsifiable assumption that um, there are laws, it seems equally reasonable to say, OK, well, then let's also make the unfalsifiable assumption that there are no other universes. And that points to God. Right. So you kind of once you've entered this area, different forms of philosophical speculation come into play and you can't cast a scientific veneer over your preferred set of assumptions because you're making an assumption that the randomness it, that it's not purely random that there are laws right the I, the the assumption that there are laws and not just randomness that have gone our way for a very long time is an article of a certain kind of faith right it's a it's a kind of scientific faith okay all right i think i get that now yeah. So, so that, that brings us to the faith perspective. <laughs> OK, that's what, and that should be uh, an interesting discussion then. Yeah. So um, 
so I, there are, I guess, several things to say here. The first one is we have, from a, from a Christian faith perspective, uh, we have some preliminary evidence that uh, things you could conceive of as other universes do exist. Um, heaven, hell, purgatory, and earth seem to be different, especially heaven, hell, and earth. Okay. Um, you know, a heaven is inhabited by angels. Angels are non-physical beings. They don't obey the same laws that we obey down here. They are capable of interacting with us, maybe kind of like dark matter is, um, but they obey their own set of laws. And so from a faith perspective, uh, it looks like there is another realm that, um, that uh, obeys different laws. And consequently, you could say, okay, that's a different universe. So we have at least a two-universe multiverse. Okay. You then can say, okay, well, what about hell? Well, hell might, <clears throat> might not be a different realm per se. It's also inhabited just like heaven is by angels and departed human souls. Hell is also inhabited by fallen angels and fallen human souls. So um, it may not be a different, re it may or may not be a different realm, but it seems to operate under the same general kind of laws that, that heaven as part of the spiritual world does. Purgatory may be just a transitional state. It may not be really a place. We don't know. But the, we have significant evidence from a faith perspective of at least one realm that is different than ours. And so if you want to call that a multiverse with at least two universes in it, you could do that. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Um, and, and none of that uh, is to say that is to make a, a, a kind of theological argument about these places, just because we know that heaven, hell and purgatory exist, but the nature of them from a, a scientific or metaphysical point of view Mm -hmm. is still a, a, an open Yeah, question. we don't know a lot about it. Okay. God right. hasn't revealed a ton to us about it. Okay, I get that. Have to wait till we get there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, now, some people, to introduce a new element into the faith perspective, some people coming from a faith perspective would say that some of the, even if we have a finite multiverse, with these at least two universes in it, even if we have a finite multiverse, we can't have the infinite kinds that um, that are being proposed by Max Tegmark and his associates. And the reason they'll say that is because they um, believe that God could not create an infinite collection of things or a universe with an infinite history. Uh, this is an argument that that sometimes is used for the existence of God. Uh, there can't be a universe with an infinite history. Therefore, our universe had to have a start. Therefore, whatever has a start has a cause. Therefore, the universe has to have a cause, and that cause is God. And even if you propose prior universes, there can't be an infinite series, because according to one of the premises of this argument, there can't be an infinite history. And this is what's known as the Kalam cosmological argument. It was originally developed um, by uh, Arabic thinkers, and it's been used uh, periodically in Christian history. Uh, St. Bonaventure in the 1200s used it, and in more recently, William Lane Craig has popularized it. Uh, I think there are some, there's some merit to some versions of the, of the Kalam argument, but personally, I don't buy this one. Um, other theologians would say, okay, it's an article, then Thomas Aquinas is an example of this, mm -hmm. um, would say, God has revealed that in fact, he did create our universe at some point in time, that it does not have an infinite history. But God is omnipotent, he can bring about any logically possible state of affairs. And so it doesn't seem to involve a logical contradiction to have the idea of an infinite history. And so God could create an infinite history if he chose. And so, um, so I would personally, even though some people would say there can't be these infinite universes with infinite space and infinite matter and infinite time, I don't buy that. I think that's within the realm of God's omnipotence to create that if he chooses. So, um, so I come down on, on the, on St. Thomas's side on that. 
I've I've looked at it, and there are some weird things that happens it, that happen if you get infinite collections, but they're just weird. They're not. They don't involve actual logical contradictions. Okay, and even if it were this this theory were true, it would only uh, affect part of the argument, like the the infinite multiple universes. Right. right? You you could still have a, a huge number of universes that God could create. Um, it, you know, there's no reason that God has with type one, there's no reason God has to make our universe only the size we can see. Right. You know, he could make it way bigger than that. The argument would just be that if Bonaventure and William Lane Craig and people like that are right, there just can't be an infinite number of other universes. There just, there would just have to be a finite number of finite universes. All right, so that's so that's part of the the uh, the, the discussion. Then is there um, more uh, to the faith perspective on this? Then there there are a, there are a few additional points. Um, one of them recently came up on a blog that I read called Instapundit. Uh, it's it's a group blog, but it's run by a law professor from Tennessee named Glenn Reynolds, and he's a very thoughtful guy. He's also a science fiction fan, and he was recently reading uh, a book involving multiverse timelines based on quantum mechanics uh, by a, a science fiction author named Greg Benford. And um, I he made an interesting point I wanted to interact with that deals with the problem of evil. Okay. Um, so if you could, I, I, I put that in the in our uh, outline. Could you uh, read that for us, Dom? Sure. Uh, to the end of that uh, bullet point? Is that, is that yeah, evidence? Yeah. Okay. So it says, uh, Glenn Reynolds writes, uh, so I'm reading Greg Benford's rewrite, and it gave me a thought about the theological implications of the many worlds version of quantum theory. Theologians have worked on the problem of evil, but I think the many worlds theory either makes it go away entirely or maybe makes it worse. On the go away entirely side, under many worlds, you don't have to worry about why God lets evil happen because God lets absolutely everything happen. And it kind of evens out. Maybe you die of pediatric cancer in one universe, but in another, you're a billionaire rock star who lives to 90 or a saint. On the other hand, on the make it worse side, everybody dies of pediatric cancer or worse in some universe or another. Yeah. So this is an interesting take on the problem of evil. And I've uh, I've written and spoken about the problem of evil before. I'd recommend uh, for folks who want a kind of an in-depth treatment, a DVD I did called The Problem of Evil. Uh, which we should probably put in the show notes. Um, But uh, Reynolds has an interesting point here. The understanding of God lets everything happen, um, and that is going to result in good and bad outcomes, and they kind of even out uh, over different timelines, um, would, if that were true, God would seem to display a kind of cosmic neutrality because he's letting all events, good and bad, happen. And as such, you couldn't charge God with allowing net evil to occur, because there's no net evil. It all balances out. Um, But you also couldn't credit God with producing net good, because there's no net good either. It all balances out. And so from this perspective, it would all be a wash. Now, um, some people might have uh, theological beliefs that could accommodate a kind of God as a kind of cosmic neutral. Uh, deists, for example, might 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 buy that. Um, from a Christian perspective and from a specifically Catholic perspective, though, um, I, I would say that's that's not the view that we have of God, because we view God as not being cosmically neutral, but as being infinitely good. And um, so from a Catholic perspective specifically, and this will be agreed with by lots of folks in the Protestant community as well and other Christian communities, um, God only allows evil when he can bring good out of it. And so every time an evil happens, some it, it's, it's going to be counterbalanced by something as good or better somehow, even if we don't know it in this life. The prime example of this is the crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, Objectively, that was an evil event, which is why uh, Jesus prayed for his uh, executioners to be forgiven. But out of that evil event, God brought about the redemption of the human race. And so um, 
So this is an example of God taking something that is evil on its face and using it to bring about good. And the uh, Christian, the Catholic perspective specifically is that that's true for every single evil. So if you look in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, this is paragraph uh, 324, it says, faith gives us the certainty that God would not permit an evil if he did not cause a good to come from that very evil by ways we shall fully know only in eternal life. So we're kind of in the perspective of a, like a little kid who's being taken to the doctor and getting a shot. From the perspective of a little kid, that's an evil. There's this stranger who's holding you down and injecting you with a sharp object, and it seems objectively evil, but really inoculating the child is going to spare the child loads of suffering later on, so it's actually a good coming from that act. In this life, we're in the perspective of the little kid getting the shot. We can't see the good that's ultimately going to be brought out of it, but with in eternity, with a greater perspective, we'll be able to appreciate that. Just as adults, we can appreciate the fact that we were inoculated as children. Um, so if that principle is true, that God brings always brings good out of evil, then even in the timelines where lots of evil occurs, God will ultimately bring good out of it. And since God is a logically necessary being that exists in every timeline, a timeline with a net negative would turn out to be to involve a logical contradiction. Okay. And so therefore, there would be no timelines that have a net negative. Uh, and in every timeline, regardless of how weird or different it is from ours, and regardless of the specific amount of evil it has in it, it's ultimately going to be a net positive because God exists in that timeline and will make sure it comes out as a net positive. And to be clear, the the nature of God is that he, there can only be one God, not right. an infinite number of gods of their Correct. own universes. However many timelines there are, however many universes there are, there's one God superintending all of them. Wow. that's. That's a that's a good one. I like that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> thank you. A um, couple other uh, points from a faith perspective. Um, one of them is it, one of them concerns identity and divine justice. Sometimes people will have an, an issue with, well, if there are these ultimate, if there are these other versions of me, who determines whether we go to heaven or not? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and what who's determining our ultimate destiny? And if you think about it, this isn't as hard as it might seem. Even down here on planet Earth, we have other versions of people. We call them twins. Yeah. Uh, a twin, an identical twin, is very, very similar to someone else, especially on the genetic level, but in other ways too, but also a little bit different. And and so um, basically, uh, twins are, all, are are like alternate versions of the same person. They're not the same person, uh, and consequently, they make their own choices. They have their own individual destinies, um, but they look very similar to each other and even behave frequently very similar to each other, but with slight differences. So if it turns out that a type one multiverse is real and there are other versions of us very, very far away, well, they're not us. There are twins. Uh, they look a lot like us. They may be genetically identical to us. They may behave a lot like us, but with subtle differences. They may even behave identically, but they're not us. They're just twins. And so their eternal destiny is on them, and our eternal destiny is on us. The only place it gets a little more interesting is, with different multiverse types is with uh, different timelines, because you could conceptualize this as there's one original timeline, which then splits yep. when we make a choice. And so let's say on my deathbed, I get up to my deathbed in one, and I make a choice in one timeline to embrace God's love and be saved. And in another timeline, I make a uh, the choice to reject God's love and be separated from him. Okay, what's my eternal fate? Well, at that point, it would seem I've just twinned. 
and there are now two versions of Jimmy Aiken. This is like what we have happening in the womb when identical twins are created. Right. Uh, you originally have one zygote. That's why these are monozygotic twins. You have one zygote that then splits to become two different people. And in that case, um, there would I I was one person. This is the same process, just it's happening at the other end of life. Um, if I'm on my deathbed, uh, you had a, a version of me that then twinned with this choice, and one twin ends up going to heaven, and one twin ends up going to hell. So that would be very interesting. Uh, but it wouldn't fundamentally contradict anything in the Christian faith. It would just mean twinning can occur in a different way than we had previously realized. So a couple of questions come up with that, which is uh -huh. one is that would mean that because all all possible decisions exist, that means that— If it means that. If, it if may it, not necessarily—because if we have free will— we may not, there may be no version of us where we choose to reject God's love. We okay. might, we might it. simply make the choice to embrace God's love, and there might not be a version of us making that other choice if we have free will. Okay, that that was my first question, and then the second one is that actually kind of related to to the science we know, which is twinning in the womb. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and this is more of a philosophical question, I guess. But when this before that zygote splits into two mm -hmm. that is one person with yep. one soul mm -hmm. and so when it splits the second zygote gets a that, that that's now there you, now that gets a soul at that point what what you can say is that before twinning you have one body and since the soul is the substantial form of the body um you have one body you have one soul after twinning you have two bodies and therefore you have two souls um, whether one of those souls was the same as the original soul when there was one body or not is an is an open question, yeah. theologically and philosophically. We don't know the answer to that. The danger is is that we think of the getting a soul as like downloading software. It's not at all like that from a philosophical or metaphysical point of view. Uh, right. The soul is downloaded by God into the body. You know, an interesting um, explanation of this from a science fiction point of view is this current TV show called Counterpart, which uh -huh. I have I have to put the disclaimer. There is uh, it's violence. a 21st century show. Is that what you're saying? It's got some stuff in it. <laughs> yes, it's got <laughs> violence and sex in it. Uh, but it, it posits that there was a, a Soviet experiment in East Germany in the 1980s that went wrong and created uh, that's basically split our universe into two parallel worlds that with a gateway in this lab that persists to this day. Ooh, what a fringy idea. Yeah, it's very it feels very much like fringe. Mm. Uh and uh and that that we pa that we pass b between it and these universes have been diverging. And so lots of these questions that you've been talking about come up including the idea of um if I'm married to a woman in this world, am I married to her in the other? Like if I go over to the mm. other side, Nope. Your twin might be, <laughs> yes. but but you're not. Right. So that would be adultery. So these things come up, and that's uh, it's a very interesting exploration of the idea with uh, one of my favorite actors, J.D. Skinner, who's really awesome. Um, so that might mm -hmm. be something, if, if you're interested in that sort of thing, maybe check out the first episode. It's in its third season, I think, now. Uh-huh. Um, so, but uh, that's a very interesting exploration of the identity question. For me, that's like the, yeah. the key one is, and, and that you answered those uh questions very well. Uh, so thank you. Is there anything one, left to talk about with faith? One more brief point. Uh, let's think about type four multiverse for a second, where every uh, logically possible state of affairs happens. Mm -hmm. Well, since they're logically possible, God can make them. And therefore, God could actualize. Now, the Bonaventure, William Lane Craig folks might disagree with this and say he couldn't do it for all of them. But I'm on the St. Thomas side. I would say God can make infinite collections, and therefore God could actualize every logically possible state of affairs. Um, would that contradict Christianity? Well, um, no, it wouldn't. But uh, you, there would be universes where Jesus didn't incarnate or where um, God chooses to have reincarnation instead of resurrection happen. Um, there, if, if you know, it would just mean God 
set up other rules for other people out there. Um, but we live in an area of the multiverse where God chose to incarnate and where he chose to have resurrection rather than reincarnation be our eternal destiny. And so we live in a universe where Christianity is true. And so uh, where God, I should say, where God implemented Christianity. And so uh, Christianity is true. Uh, and it's what applies to us here. The idea of God creating other universes with other rules, including other religious rules, that's up to God. Mm. I think this next thing I say is going to be it should be a topic that we explore further because at mm -hmm. the risk of making this episode even longer than it is, which mm -hmm. is um, is the resurrection just for us on this world or is it for all our universe? or for all uni possible universes. Uh, you we partially can, answered that, I think. Yeah, but. We, can, we can definitely talk about that more in the future. The brief answer is we know it's our destiny. God has revealed that to us. We don't know if it's anybody else's destiny. It may or may not be. Interesting. Okay. Uh, so stay tuned, folks, because uh, stay subscribed, because uh, that should be an interesting discussion when we get to that. Yeah. So um, I think uh, so we've like, explored the faith perspective, the reason perspective. So wh where's what's your bottom line, Jimmy, on this question? The bottom line is that there do seem to be realms outside of the visible universe. Uh, there seems to be a spiritual world that it, that operates under other laws, with namely heaven. And that may have other parallels like hell or purgatory. And uh, I mean, we know hell and purgatory exist. The question is, are they separate realms? Um, and. So you could say, okay, those are other worlds, and therefore you could say we have at least something of a multiverse. Whether there are other physical worlds out there, like in Max Tegmark's versions, um, that's that's a question that is a matter of philosophical speculation. We don't have scientific evidence for it, but it's ultimately God's decision. He could create them if he wants. Excellent. So uh, so if people wanted to, to explore more on this topic, uh, do you have some resources that people can look at? Yeah. Um, so first one is an article that I wrote called What in the World is the Multiverse? And it's it's at jimmyakin.com. We'll have a link in the show notes. I also linked Wikipedia's article on the multiverse. And we've got a link to the book Parallel Worlds by the physicist Michio Kaku. He's very accessible as a science writer. He's a really gifted communicator in breaking down scientific ideas in an understandable, entertaining way. So Parallel Worlds by Michio Kaku. Uh, also, uh, I have a link to an article in the New York Times called A Brief History of the Multiverse by physicist Paul Davies, and he takes a more critical approach to it. Uh, he's one of the folks who points out this is more speculative. This is not well scientifically grounded. Okay. And we'll also include that link to uh, your DVD on the problem of evil as well. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. So uh, so I think that wraps up that topic. So let's move on to some uh, of our mysterious feedback from our listeners. Uh, First one is uh, we got a lot of great feedback on the uh, mystery of weight loss episode. Um, such such lots of people love that episode. So uh, we'll get into some of that here. Uh, Richard H. from Patreon uh, says, um, I've dabbled with 5-2 fasting, but the recent show on the mysteries of dieting or weight loss spurred me on to try a bit harder. Into day four of only eating between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. for a week. Feel great. Is there anything about the impact of fasting on the senses as my hearing and vision seem more focused? I'm not aware. So for people who haven't heard that episode yet, one of the things we talked about a lot is intermittent fasting, which I've lost a huge amount of weight with. It's it it's the thing that I've found to be most effective. Um, and so uh, I'm not aware of studies specifically on hearing and vision and are they improved but there are there is evidence that fasting increases your mental acuity um the uh, the theory is that you know when your body says okay we don't have any food it thinks well we need to get him more alert so he can go kill an antelope or something and then <laughs> we'll have food so it, it you know it primes our hunting abilities gets us more alert and more focused. And so it could be that it's that greater mental acuity that is creating the impression of uh, hearing and vision seeming to be more acute and more focused. Incidentally, uh, in 
even though they didn't have the modern scientific studies, uh, aspects of this were known 100 years ago because in the Conan Doyle Sherlock Holmes stories, Sherlock sometimes uses fasting specifically to improve his mental concentration. Oh, interesting. Uh, so, uh, Aaron, so thank you, Richard, by the way, from Patreon, one of our Patreon supporters. Uh, Aaron on Twitter says, thank you. Down 14 and a half pounds since listening to your episode on weight loss. That's awesome. That's uh, just yeah. a couple of weeks. <laughs> That's, That's great. Funny. I wish I could do that. Uh, so and then uh, Patty uh, b- uh, by email says, uh, I recently listened to your podcast about your experience with intermittent fasting. You've inspired me to start. I've been doing it for almost two weeks. I like to go to daily mass, but will will be receiving Holy Communion. Oh, but will receiving Holy Communion break my fast? Will it have negative effects and hinder the physical benefits of fasting? Maybe I have to do a spiritual communion during the week and receive only on Sunday. Thanks for any insight you can give on this. I didn't know who else to ask. Well, folks, let me tell you: if you have a question, you ask Jimmy because he gets the answers <laughs> uh, on on many topics. And fortunately, on this one, um, the your metabolism is going to look at a host and say this isn't going to have a big impact. So there's not going to be appreciable metabolic impact as a result of receiving a single host in communion or a single sip from the chalice. It's not going to do very much to your metabolism. So don't worry about it. Go ahead and receive. Excellent. Uh, Atomic B on YouTube says, I just finished a 29 day water fast. Cool. Awesome. Um, and that illustrates that lengthier fasts are quite possible, and it's good that he was drinking water because you do need to do that with extended fasts. Yes. Um, but uh, but it is quite possible to fast for a month or more, just like Jesus fasted 40 days in the desert. Right. Uh, so in uh, Ryan T. via email says, a fascinating episode. Thanks so much for your thought-provoking analysis. I especially appreciated your convincing critique of the old food pyramid model. Quick question, if I may. You make a convincing case here that diet and intermittent fasting, more so than exercise, is the best means of weight loss. That being said, you seem to still agree that exercise is still a good idea for healthy living, more broadly speaking. So do you have thoughts on type or how often one should exercise as part of a healthy lifestyle? Um, this is an area, it, it's really going to depend on you and your health needs. It's more important for some people to exercise, to make a focused effort at exercising than it is for others. Um, it's going to depend on your health needs. And this is an area where I haven't done as much research yet. I've done some research into exercise, not a ton. I tend to do a mix, uh, and I tend to mostly dance because it's, it's more fun than just going to a gym. Um, But I do a variety of dancing. Uh, Some of it is sort of low impact, but lengthy. And then others is high impact in short bursts. And so it's kind of the equivalent of aerobic training versus interval training. And I I try to get a mix of both, but uh, not, I don't do it to excess, um, but, uh, and it's not my area of expertise, but I would say um, probably something of a mix is good, but what your specific needs are going to be is something I'm not able to advise you on. Okay. So, uh, Thank you all for your your mysterious feedback. Uh, we really appreciate it, and please keep it coming. We'll give you all the the ways that you can uh, send us your feedback uh, at the end of the show. But uh, before we get to that, Jimmy, do you have some mysterious headlines for us this week? Yeah. So the first one is a is, and and steampunk people are going to love this. A steam powered spacecraft <laughs> has been designed. Um, now people may be aware. Longtime science fiction fans may be aware of something called a ram scoop. Uh, a ram scoop is a type of ship. The theory is it will collect it, like throws out a big magnetic field and collects hydrogen from the space in front of it and then fuses that hydrogen to propel itself forward. So it like harvests its own fuel. The problem with ram scoops, other than we haven't built them, is it's not clear if you can extract enough hydrogen to really make this a viable proposition. Um, but a steam powered spacecraft that could operate in our solar system indefinitely has been designed. The idea is it lands on one of the many bodies in our solar system that has water ice and harvests that water ice and then heats it and uses it as reaction mass. So it uh, propels itself using steam power. 
And uh, it's a fascinating concept. And since there's so much water ice in our solar system, it could operate for a very extended period of time. It would not run out of reaction mass fuel. Wow. <laughs> Who does think of that? Uh, a steam powered spaceship. That's awesome. Yeah. So what else do what, we have? One other one other headline, and it also has to deal with ice. Um, recently, there uh, on the uh, uh, Presumpscot River, a a big, huge disk of ice formed that some pe- that rotates, and some people says it looks like a flying saucer. And it, it mm. yeah, it looks like a flying saucer or a lazy Susan or <laughs> whatever you want to imagine. But it's a big circle of ice, and it's just fascinating to see how water moving in a frozen river can lead to a chunk of it spinning around and gradually becoming huge and circular. So it's interesting to look at. It's a lot like your cotton candy as you spin it around inside yeah. the machine, it forms a ball. Uh, I have to actually point out that I have a personal connection to this chunk of ice or where it uh-huh. is. That my, my mom and my sister, until very recently, lived in the town of Westbrook. So I'm very familiar with this location. So it's oh, kind, okay. of, kind of fun. There's also a, uh, a, uh, a mysterious uh, creature that lives there. It's in the article that we link uh, that dubbed Wessie uh, for yes. Westbrook. Yes, yeah. The, 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 it's a... It, it's, speculated it's a big snake that somebody got let loose out of their uh, house uh, like a like a tropical snake of some sort that's still living there uh and that uh, causes all kinds of fun speculation Ooh, maybe it's work. hibernating in the ice yes exactly uh but uh the, the, this uh ice thing is is fun and uh there's obviously a natural explanation for it but it's a lot of fun to to look at so all right that's awesome so some uh some great uh, uh mysterious headlines for you Uh, Before we wrap up, I would like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible. Uh, And today I want to thank by name. um, I'm going to try to pronounce this. I think it's a Polish name, Masij. Sorry if I if I if I uh, mispronounce it. I'm not very good at Polish names. Masij B. We're we're great. We're grateful either way. (laughs) Exactly. Mm. Uh, John L. Les R. Paul L. And Terry M. Through their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give. Uh, as well as everyone who gives. You all make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows we do at sqpn.com. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. What do you think of all this uh, talk about the multiverse and, and Jimmy's explanations and the explorations of, the, of this idea? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page and leaving some feedback there on the show. Uh, you can send us an email to mysterious at sqpn. And uh, just new this week, we have a new way you can send feedback. You can send a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. Uh, if, you, if you send us a tweet there with that hashtag, uh, we'll, we'll be sure to get it and uh, hopefully include it in a future episode. Or even if you just tweet to <clears throat> tweet to one of us, but use hashtag mysterious feedback, it'll it'll flag it as something that we can pick up for the show. Exactly. The hashtag is the is the key on that one. So and also, if you can, please remember to like this episode on the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, to retweet it on Twitter. We will post it at SQPN and the new uh, Twitter account. Subscribe to the show. If you're not subscribed, do so if you can. Uh, so that you automatically get new episodes. You don't have to remember to go look for it. Uh, You can subscribe in iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app, uh, or on YouTube, where you can hit the bell to get notifications when a new episode goes up. You can listen on your your Amazon Echo device by uh, saying uh, uh, Echo or whatever the the wake word is for you. Um, Play Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World podcast, and that will start playing the latest episode. Um, And please, share the podcast with your friends, write a review in iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. That helps us grow the community. And the more people that become part of our community, the the longer we can sustain this show uh, into the future. That's what it's about. And we can reach more people with this great content. I mean, uh, obviously, a lot of you love uh, what Jimmy's uh, bringing to the show. And let's share it with more people. You can find all the relevant links for our resources and the headlines in this uh, in our show notes on sqpn.com slash mysterious. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>